first, I want to welcome another old, um, he's old and he's also an old friend, <laughs> Older. is my good buddy Dave Megacy. Good morning, Dave. Good morning, <laughs> morning Michael. Stay close to that <laughs> yeah, microphone. Absolutely. Okay, uh, I will. <clears throat> uh, those of you who uh, have followed sports and followed politics <clears throat> know that David Megacy um, came out of Syracuse University. He was an All-American. Uh, he was a linebacker, started as a tackle, was a linebacker, went on to play seven years in pro football with the St. Louis Cardinals football team. Uh, he became disenchanted with uh, not only the war in Vietnam, but the racism that he encountered in the game of football. And he wrote a wonderful book, which has been re-released by the University of Nebraska Press, called Out of Their League. And um, I first met David in Uptown in Chicago uh, when Peggy Terry was running for vice president back in 68. And he and a guy named Rick Sortoon uh, were in the Cardinal training camp up at Lake Forest College in those days. And we shook hands and uh, somehow uh, we must have had a good conversation. Uh, I went down to St. Louis, got a little bit involved with him with some projects we were working on. And then a number of years later, I was in the seed office and someone said, hey, this guy Megas, he has a book out and you're in it. Uh, I made contact and we've been hanging out ever since. So with all that said, <laughs> all that said, <laughs> what are you doing these days, Dave? Oh, my goodness sakes. Uh, well, uh, I, uh, I just finished 20, well, uh, a few years ago, a couple years ago, finished 25 years with the NFL Players Association, which is the Players Union and uh, went through uh, what I call a, uh, basically an 11-year war with the owners to, uh, to win uh, free agency for the players, which uh, meant for them uh, a much fairer share of the revenues that uh, they ultimately generate in their performance on a football field. The NFL is big business now. It's about an $8.5 billion business every year. And uh, we certainly increase the, uh, the leverage of players to, uh, to earn what they are worth, what their value is, uh, in this uh, huge sports entertainment complex called the National Football League. Well, we got a lot of stuff we want to cover here today, I could tell. Uh, yes. You got a whole list of <laughs> notes. And uh, notes. we had talked a little bit earlier this morning about uh, not only Athletes United for Peace, the Olympics, uh, the Africa Games, number of things, but let's talk a little bit about professional football. Uh, and I, the couple of things are on my mind. I won't ask them all at once. Let's do them one at a time. And one of those would be uh, a little bit of a brief history of that labor struggle you referred to where the players basically who consider themselves the key to the game uh, really took control of the game. But Gene Upshaw has passed on. There's a new executive uh, director of the union, and there are negotiations looming. And I think, uh, I have no idea what's going to happen. Will the players maintain their position? Will there, is there a threat to the players' position? Uh, tell us how you see it as a retired union organizer for the NFL Players Association. Well, I think to back up a little bit, Michael, um, as Jeffrey talked about, Fred Hampton, who was part of our uh, collective history of, uh, of the struggle and, and efforts to create a better world here. Uh, solidarity is a key part of anything that gets done. And one of the things that we accomplished during the, uh, the time I was with the union was, and, and when Gene Upshaw was alive and under his leadership was to have solidarity with uh, the players and with what we were trying to uh, achieve, which was their liberation, basically their freedom. Uh, in the system of the NFL, prior to what is known as free agency, players were drafted, which meant they were assigned to a team, and that team had the rights to their services as a professional football player for life. In other words, a player could never leave. They were assigned to a team out of college. They could never leave, and so uh, they basically were paid what the owners wanted to pay them, what the team owner wanted to pay them. So the struggle for us was to achieve freedom for the players to uh, be able to, when their contract expired, their player contract expired, to negotiate with any of the 32 teams in the National Football League uh, for many different reasons. One of them maybe being, certainly being money, one of them being, uh, being closer to their hometown or closer to the college where they played a whole range of reasons, but 
Players never had that right. So that baseline was the struggle of what we uh, were trying to achieve and did achieve. And um, the other part of it that we negotiated in the agreement was that the players would receive a certain percentage of the revenues of the league, which is right now at 60%. The owners think they're paying the players too much money, and uh, so the owners have uh, opted out of the collective bargaining agreement a year earlier, which was their, their right to do that. And so I think it's going to be a pretty intense uh, struggle, and the players are basically going to have to maintain their solidarity uh, as they did uh, to win free agency to, uh, to maintain what they have already, have already won. Uh, Dean Maurice Smith is a new executive director. He's uh, a, a younger man, African-American uh, lawyer out of Washington, D.C., came up from the streets, as he says and uh, e extremely intelligent and capable, and uh, so I think we're in good shape from the leadership standpoint. But ultimately, what the players do will, will, will rest on how solid they are together, uh, solidarity. And, uh, and it sounds like to me from talking to people there now, although I am retired, is that that is, uh, that is a, a fact of life, and uh, so I think it's, they're, gonna be, they're gonna be in good shape. So you, if you were a gambling man, you would think that the players will come out all right on this. Because, you know, there so, yeah. always was the attempts to divide off uh, some elite players, the quarterbacks from the well, rank-and-file linemen. And well, that's true in any social movement, and certainly was true in the, in the movement for social justice in which the, uh, the Black Panther Party, uh, Rising Up Angry, all the, the groups uh, that, that were mentioned uh, by Jeffrey um, were, were trying to achieve, but there's always the divide and conquer. You try to get rid of the leadership and uh, you try to divide people to eliminate solidarity. And uh, so uh, I think uh, the players are pretty solid. They see the benefits of what they've achieved. They're making a lot of money, which they should be. It's an extremely competitive business. The average life is less than four years in the National Football League. And uh, these guys are extraordinary athletes. And uh, as we're finding out, what I call the elephant in the living room, is that the, uh, the, uh, the rate of concussions, the number of concussions, and the consequence of those concussions on later life is a big part of the National Football League. So it's a pretty dangerous game to play at that level. And uh, players put their bodies on the line to do it. I was going to ask you about the concussion thing. It's gotten a lot of press. Uh, apparently, there are a lot more concussions than people ever realized. Um, uh, do you think, uh, what are the new policies around that, and uh, how does that affect uh, the general care of the players on the part of the, the institution well, of I, professional I, football? Right, and there's a number of issues, Michael, with that. I remember when I played, and this was back in the 60s, of getting a major concussion, and I, I really thought I was not ever going to come back to being normal. A concussion is a problem because you can't see it. Uh, you know, you've got a, a broken leg or a knee or a shoulder or an elbow. Uh, uh, you can see that. A concussion is something kind of uh, certainly inside your head. You can't see it. And it's totally subjective. It's based on how you feel. And, um, uh, and what uh, we're finding out, and certainly it was the case back then, is uh, if you can walk, you want to play. And whether you have a concussion or not, you kind of want to disregard it and feel it's not that important to you. So if you can remember the plays and get on the field, you want to play. And that's what people are finding out is still the case. Uh, the Associated Press did a survey of 160 players, and 30 players said that, yes, indeed, they did have concussions while playing, and they hid them from management or the team physicians because they did not want to get off the field. As I said, it's a very competitive business, and, of course, the fear is, is, once you're off the field injured, somebody's going to take your job. The new policy is uh, with the union and the management is to have a, uh, a uh, high grade, if you will, uh, neurologist uh, as part of the uh, medical team of every team in the National Football League uh, so that if somebody gets a concussion or gets dinged, as we say, they're examined by a real professional and not by a an orthopedist, <laughs> and uh, 
Uh, so this, then, would, this would be a shift from the, the days when the doctors kind of okay well, uh, a player to go even if he's got significant yeah, and, industries. And the, and the second part Injuries. of the problem is, is that the team physicians are still hired by the team management and not by the players' union, which my view has always been they should be hired by the players' union. So we've kind of upgraded it a little bit, but I still think we have a long ways to go with it.